Thanks for joining us this evening for our final All Rich virtual presentation by curator, author, and educator, Jay Williams. I'm Leslie Brothers, director of the All Rich Museum of Art, and I'm here with my colleagues, Jana Irwin, head of education, and Ksenia Gerstein, curator of modern and contemporary art. I wanna take a moment to thank Jana for her ingenuity in creating the truly inspired All Rich Virtual Series in response to the loss of in-person gatherings and for seamlessly producing over 40 presentations. Thank you, Ksenia, for contributing equally to the huge success of the series with your warm and insightful introductions and your star quality Q&A sessions. Our very exciting summer exhibitions are on view through July 31st. Do not miss Art as a Superpower, featuring a selection of new acquisitions from the past five years and On Vacation, also drawn from the museum's collection with seven series of prints depicting an array of possible vacation activities. Featured are John Vader's Outstanding Diners. On Vacation is funded in part by Lee and Ron Starkle in the Ulrich Museum Alliance. Programs and exhibitions at the museum are funded by Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission through the National Endowment for the Arts. Humanities Kansas and the city of Wichita, we thank them all for their support and we love working with them. It is now my pleasure to pass the screen to Ksenia, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you all for being here. And for those of you who have been with us for the past 16 months, uh, we are grateful and we hope to see you at the museum. Hi everyone. Um, welcome for me as well. <laughs> And um, I want to second Leslie in saying thank you for being here tonight for our last Ulrich virtual event. Um, so for, I guess, the last time, which is mind bending, um, I'll be doing a Zoom introduction. And tonight it is my pleasure to introduce curator and author Jay Williams. Uh, Jay's career in the arts has spanned over 35 years and prior to his retirement to, as we just learned, the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina, he was most recently the curator at the Vero Beach Museum of Art in Vero Beach, Florida. Before that, he held curatorial and educator positions at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona Beach, the Morris Museum of Art in Augusta, Georgia, the McKissick Museum at the University of South Carolina, and the Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida, among other places. Two of his notable exhibitions at the Vero Beach Museum were the, 20, two, the 2012 show, Beyond Reality, Hyperrealism in American Culture, and the 2016 project, John Bader, American Roadside. Uh, Jay is an expert on American hyperrealist painting, and it is in this capacity that he joins us tonight to speak about the artist John Bader, on whose work he wrote the 2015 monograph, John Bader's Road Well Taken. John Bader is a painter and printmaker whom the Chicago Tribune reviewer of Jay's book describes, and I thought this was a really lovely way to be described for anybody, as quote, legendary among roadside architecture enthusiasts, end quote. Bader's 1978 book, Diners, which was full of reproductions of his photorealistic paintings of the eponymous eateries, took them seriously as a part of American cultural history long before it was fashionable or cool or before there came the wave of nostalgia for diners, which continues to this day. Uh, John Bader's interest in vernacular architecture resonated with the interests of other acclaimed cultural figures at the time in the 70s, like architect Robert Venturi and photographer Stephen Shore. And John Bader's documentation of diners contributed to the increased interest in them later on, uh, as well as contributed to the preservation of some particular structures because they suddenly sort of were seen as noteworthy. 
We at the Ulrich feel very fortunate to have the six prints by John Bader that are on view at the museum right now and are very excited to be able to hear ourselves and share with you Jay's insights and deep knowledge of this work. As with all the other programs in this series, uh, Jay, uh, Jay will speak for about 45 minutes, at which point we'll open our virtual floor for Q&A. Uh, you're all welcome to participate in that and we encourage questions. You can put questions into the Q&A box at any time and then I'll moderate a discussion at the end. The Q&A box is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And with all of those preliminaries out of the way, I want to say welcome, Jay. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you at the Ulrich and all of you listening tonight. I'm so glad to be with you to present John Bader, A Road Well Taken. John Bader has described the act of painting as an act of transcendence. But what does that mean? For John Bader, making a painting is like creating a short story or a poem, not like writing a newspaper article. Eudora Welty, the famous Southern writer observed, fiction is all bound up in the local. And she also wrote, feelings are bound up in place. The human mind is a mass of associations associations more poetic even than actual. That combination of local authenticity and visual poetry is what I find so fascinating in the work of John Bader. Let's have the next slide. The well-known art dealer Ivan Karp can be credited with discovering the work of John Bader. He had established O.K. Harris Works of Art in New York's Soho District in 1969. Karp had already discovered many important artists such as Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein while he worked as co-director of Leo Castelli Gallery. When he went out on his own, he wanted to show what he called works of cultural consequence that have visual power. He found that in the paintings of John Bader, especially John's diner paintings. But what was John Bader doing before he began to paint diners? Let's have the next slide. Next slide, please. In the 1960s, John Bader was a highly successful art director at several top advertising agencies, representing clients such as Coca-Cola, Standard Oil of New Jersey, and Pillsbury. During that time, John became more and more fascinated with what people now call roadside culture. Roadside culture includes the architecture, the gas stations, the mom and pop motels, restaurants, advertising, even the roadmaps produced between the 1920s and the 1970s. In the 1920s, the network of US highways, such as US 54 and US 81 that run through Wichita, these routes were created in 1926, and by the 1930s, major portions of them were paved. However, if you were motoring through Kansas in the early 1930s along a US highway, along either of those US highways, you might have encountered long sections of highways like US 54 that were still gravel and major segments in some counties that were noted on the state map as earth, in other words, dirt, all that changed after World War II. Let's have the next slide, please. By the 1950s, tourists and business travelers were able to travel on a network of all weather paved roads. The postcard industry blossomed, so did motels. On the lower left is a typical motel postcard of the era. This one is from the Plaza Court Motel on South Broadway in Wichita. Incidentally, the word motel was a new word, first used by a motor hotel in California in 1925. Next slide, please. For those who couldn't afford to stay in a downtown hotel or highway motel, there were tourist camps like these. These are Kansas examples, but they thrived throughout the nation. Travel trailers also became increasingly popular in the 1920s and 1930s. 
John Bader collected photographs and postcards documenting roadside culture of all kinds. Next slide, please. John collected color and black and white postcards while he was working as an art director at prestigious advertising agencies such as Marshawk and McCann Erickson. On weekends, he searched for the cards in flea markets and bought some from antique dealers. His favorite postcards were published later in his book, Gas, Food and Lodging in 1982. Next slide. Linen finish color postcards were the inspiration for John Bader's first series of paintings. What you're seeing here are examples of the paintings, not the postcards. The actual postcards were created from retouched images with manipulated color. The colorizing process usually involved airbrushing, editing out imperfections, and selecting vivid colors from a predetermined palette. John Bader thought that the linen cards were quote unquote, already art that should be made into paintings. He wrote that they function on the other side of reality and described them as pure fantasy. When John changed the scale from the three and a half by five inches of the cards up to the 42 by 66 inches of the paintings, he emphasized their surreal quality. Look at streamlined service and notice how the form of the gas station is just that, streamlined. And on the upper right, the really oddball octo cottages. And, in the and on the lower right, cozy cabin camp, which seems like it should be built along the yellow brick road in the Wizard of Oz instead of the outskirts of Folkestone, Georgia. Next slide. This is another of John's postcard inspired paintings, the Salad Bowl Restaurant in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. The postcards on the left are similar to John's source. Notice that he included the type printed along the edge of the card. It's an important part of the image and makes us aware of all the lettering in the image. On the reverse side of the postcard on the upper left, it says, recommended by Duncan Hines. For those of you who think that Duncan Hines was a guy who made brownie mix, <laughs> I have to tell you, Duncan Hines was a traveling salesman who drove the US highways in the 30s and 40s. He was a traveling salesman who, who traveled really the whole country, including through Arkansas and US 67, past the salad bowl restaurant. He was always in search of good restaurants and published his reviews in a book called Adventures in Good Eating. This was kind of like the predecessor of today's inter, uh, internet related reviews. The book came out of the 1930s as, and was in print for about 20 years. Restaurants proudly displayed signs saying, recommended by Duncan Hines. Next slide. Dutch Diner was painted in 1971. It was also inspired by a linen finish color postcard. It was John Bader's first diner painting and the first image he painted after deciding to leave advertising and paint full time. At that point, he was not really committed to painting diners any more than other roadside architecture. Notice the slogan, meals like mother makes. Obviously John liked this slogan. It tells you you'll feel right at home here. Next slide. Ivan Karp visited John Bader's studio on a Sunday morning in 1972. At that point, John Bader had completed four paintings, including Dutch Diner. John, B uh, pardon me, Ivan Karp offered John Bader an exhibition on the basis of seeing just those four paintings. It was an almost unheard of opportunity for an unknown artist. John soon quit his lucrative job as one of New York's top ad agency art directors and began painting full time. Next slide. John next gravitated toward images related to black and white postcard views of what he termed the sacred small town. These views were often shown in glossy black and white postcards that where you got the view right down the middle of Main Street, like the one that you see on the left of Garden City, Kansas. You can also find similar views in hand colored linen postcards but they have a different feeling. 
John identified with the anonymous photographer or the street photographer, you might call him, who went from town to town. These photographers were unpretentious, straightforward and loved their work. And that's why John admired them or still admires them. Next slide. This is not a photograph that you're seeing on the screen. It's John Bader's oil painting of a downtown street scene in Klamath, California. He painted this from a black and white postcard view like the one that you saw on the previous slide. Part of the appeal of Bader's paintings is the change in scale. This painting is 42 by 66 inches. That's a large enough that it, it really imposes a vision, a different vision really from, than that in the original pa uh, photograph. The change in scale forces you to be aware of details that you might otherwise take for granted. And it helps you appreciate the real character of the place. Next slide. John studied the work of documentary photographers such as Russell Lee and Marion Post Walcott. He spent hours at the Library of Congress and looked at the work of all the Farm Security Administration photographers who documented small town and rural life in the United States between 1935 and 1943 during the Great Depression and the early years of World War II. On the upper left is Marion Post Walcott's photograph and at the right, John, Pater, John Bader's painting of the Midwest Cafe. The painting measures 60 by 72 inches. Incidentally, in 1941, you could have driven west on, on US 40 from Topeka or Salina, Kansas, straight to the Midwest Cafe in Craig, Colorado. Isn't that something? More than 600 miles, but worth the trip. Both Marion Post Walcott and John Bader made many such trips. Next slide. After working in a monochrome palette, John Bader felt a need to paint in color and also to paint from his own original photographs because he'd been traveling a lot and had shot many, many Kodachrome slides. He also began to feel committed to painting diners, images of diners in particular. He wrote, I want to preserve diners. I, I love them and I express this passion by painting them. Next slide. Beginning in 1973 with Diner, Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, Bader added color to his palette. Notice the rather funny yellow sign above the diner as though you might not know what it was. Color lends a, a sense of authenticity to these paintings and realism breaks down the formal barrier with the audience. Viewers can suspend disbelief and enter Bader's idealized world Maple Diner is one of John's really magical paintings. Bader wrote, fall is my favorite time of year. The symphony of color, light and mood provides a different sense of energy, a different kind of energy for my travels and searching. Next slide. John Bader certainly works from photographs, but to call him a, pho a photo realist is something of a misnomer. Here's the reason. He is emotionally involved with his imagery, as were the 19th century realist painters, including John Constable and Gustave Courbet. In contrast, Richard Estes, one of the best known photorealists, said that his imagery was purely conceptual and detached from any involvement with his subject. He was much more concerned with the effects of light, such as reflections. Next slide. When John painted Scott's Bridge Diner in 1974, he fantasized that he was inside the painting, first laying the bricks and, paint, and then painting them, lettering the sign, feeling the cement with his hands and knees, installing neon tubes and so on. He wrote, I got inside this painting and it was bigger than painting and bigger than me and the whole world. John Bader quoted, John Dewey, uh, his book, Art and Experience, would, when explaining another of his 1974 paintings. A work of art elicits and accentuates the quality of being a whole and belonging to a larger, all-inclusive whole, which is the universe in which we live. 
John's world expanded and became richer as he became more and more involved with painting roadside culture. Next slide, please. Color relationships are a key part of John Bader's works of art. For example, he points out that the pink cloud over the diner sign in Angelo's that you see here is very important. Skies often set a mood and tie color relationships together. Look at the color rhythms here. Repetition of red and the color yellow accentuates where the eye should go. His color relationships usually accent specific forms and relate to the placement of cars and forms of architecture and the forms of architecture. Let's have the next slide, please. Cars are a recurring theme in John's work and a multifaceted symbol. He's owned several Cadillacs. They have special meaning for him. In the lower right, you see a snapshot of John with his pride and joy, the 1941 Cadillac Fleetwood. Next slide. As a former art, ad agency art director, John loves typography and signage. Slogans and logos are important. Whenever you see them in a painting, you, can, you know they're not there just by chance. They imply continuity and values. The Majestic, the diner that you see here, has special meaning for John. He used to ride his bike to this diner as a boy in Atlanta. When he revisited the diner in the 1970s, he encountered this bright yellow bread truck and he just loved it. It was parked right outside and he loved both the yellow color and the truck's old fashioned logo. Next slide. Good Food Diner from 1979 combines two of John's passions, his love of diners and his love for hand painted signs. Take a minute and read some of those hand painted inscriptions to yourself. Also, look at how the hand painted lettering contrasts with the sign with the diner's name and the old Coca-Cola signs. Look how perfectly John has depicted the peeling paint of the old lettering on the brick. And don't miss the long shadows in the pavement and the reflection in the puddle and that single window high on the brick wall. Next slide. You can see why John Bader appreciates the photography of Walker Evans, who shot this wonderful image in 1936. Bader enjoys a sign that, as he says, becomes something more than it was intended to be when it transforms itself to another level. Next slide. Let's look at diner names in John's works of art. Some are the names of individuals like curlies or locations like river, or they might be fanciful such as the majestic or as above blue moon diner. And incidentally, blue moon diner was not the name of the diner in actuality, John added that name. Name signs like all the other details in his paintings give the painting a definite personality. Each diner ref reflects a human connection John makes you wonder about those relationships. Next slide. The embassy is a great name for a diner, don't you agree? <laughs> I smile at the thought of diplomats hovering over their heavy china cups of diner coffee. John photographed the embassy in the 1970s and decided to create a soft ground etching of the image. He worked with a master printer, Don H. Stewart, to create the plate and pulled a small number of proofs plus 40 limited edition prints. This etching appeared in the first edition of his book, Diners. Years later, John painted his last series of diner canvases. So the, the canvas that you see represented on the left was part of that last series of diners. He painted these from original slide, slides he had shot around the country of, of uh, and he selected from these thousands of slides, those which he thought were important but had never made it into paintings at that point. 
There's so many things to love about this painting. The name itself, the handling of the pavement, look at the stains in the pavement, the arrows, and especially those color relationships and that factory hovering over the diner. The factory incidentally is a factory owned by the parent company of the company that manufactured the diner. The diner was manufactured by a company called J.G. Brill, probably in the late 1920s. They also manufacture trolleys and interurban rail cars. The diner was moved from this location to another one in Massachusetts, eventually. It was renamed and operated at least into the 1980s. But the embassy lived on, lives on in these works of art. Next slide, please. People took diners for granted until the late 1970s, when fast food chains really began to take over. In 1978, Abrams published John Bader's classic book, Diners, which was in print for years and sold thousands and thousands of copies. 50 of John's paintings were reproduced in that original edition, 50 in color and more in black and white. Abrams came out with a revised edition in 1995 that included more of John's canvases in color. It's not a coincidence that when John was painting diners, historic preservationists began to look at art moderne and art deco buildings as worth preserving. South Miami Beach, those wonderful hotels and other structures there are a prime example. Can you believe they almost tore those down? And I was living in Florida at the time and I can tell you they almost did. On the left is the Club Modern in, of all places, Anaconda, Montana. It was added to the Register, National Register of Historic Places in 1986. Now, would that have ever happened without some different consciousness having been raised? Buildings in this style, like diners and many Art Deco buildings, have been torn down. But fortunately, the Club Modern was added to the National Register and was preserved. Above right is Lammy's Diner, produced by the Worcester Lunch Car Company. It was restored and made part of the Henry Ford Museum. Worcester Lunch Cars was just one of many, many companies that manufactured diners. They manufactured alone more than 650 diners, but few remain today. John's paintings have made people understand that it's important to preserve, to preserve the culture of everyday Americans, not just historic houses and places where presidents were born. Next slide, please. John Bader's quest to preserve diners meant that he lived the great American road trip. Let me explain. In the middle years of the 20th century, people traveled increasingly by car. And after World War II, families really began to go on what I think of as secular pilgrimages to honor the American dream. Diners and mom and pop motels were a bit like the medieval taverns and inns that catered especially to pilgrims on their way to exalted destinations. Medieval pilgrims might have uh, gone on pilgrimage, pilgrimages to Canterbury or Santiago de Compostela. Modern Americans dreamed of traveling to Disneyland or an exotic city like Miami or San Francisco or a national park like Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon or Yosemite. Diners such as Hunt's Diner in Wichita flourished in the era before corporate fast food when Americans yearned to see the USA in their Chevrolet or their Ford or their VW or their Cadillac. <laughs> Next slide. Diners could be found everywhere that the US highways crisscrossed the country. In Wichita, US 54 running east and west and US 81 running north and south are good examples. Valentine diners manufactured in Wichita, right there in Wichita, were smaller in scale than some others perfect for small towns. On the upper right, we see a shot of a Valentine diner ready for delivery. Examples of Valentine diners can still be found in Ohio, Indiana, Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and many other states. On the lower right, on the lower right 
you see their little chef model. And on the left is an interior view that shows the diner's shiny interior with its nine stools and beyond them, three booths. Next slide, please. One of the most unusual Valentine diners is the King Chef in Colorado Springs. John Bader explained recently, when I was painting it, I really got into the idea of this oddball diner next to this building in this church, a totally incongruous juxtaposition of architecture along with the diner's faux castle appearance. And don't you love the little green truck, how its lines just complement and the color, that green color next to the violet of the castle, wonderful stuff. Next slide, please. Here's the Royal Diner, an example in the Ulrich Museum's collection. At a diner, the chef was royalty. He performed his little dance behind the counter, doing all those jobs and coordinating all those things, usually in full view of the customers. John Bader wrote that the Royal Diner was across the street from the rather lovely Maple Diner that you saw in an earlier slide. John met the Greek owner who seemed a bit ashamed of his diner. He called it a piece of junk. Bader didn't believe him and, and he painted a still life showing the cut glass vase and plastic rose that he found at each booth. John also said that he bought two chili dogs there, no doubt fit for a king. Next slide, please. Diners weren't just places to get anonymous fast food. They were places where food was shared and long running relationships flourished. Eve Jackson, a Jungian psychoanalyst has written, sharing food is a fundamental bonding ritual in which we affirm our common identity as members of a family or a group. Next slide. John Bader feels that diners are essentially feminine forms horizontal and welcoming, as opposed to vertical masculine forms like high-rise buildings. The portal of the diner is a symbol of welcome, so it's often emphasized. This print is part of the 1980 portfolio of silkscreen prints of Bader's Diners, published by London Arts. The screen printer used 30 or more colors to try to approach the subtle colors in John Bader's oil paintings and watercolors. Next slide, please. John Bader sees diners as a symbol of the great provider, the archetypal mother. She is beautiful, but approachable and nurturing, there when you need her. The Red Robin is no doubt one of the country's most well-known diners. Unfortunately, it closed its door just doors just this year because of COVID. Next slide, please. The Magic Chef, the painting that you see on the left, was used on the cover of John Bader's Road Well Taken, his biography published in 2015. About the Magic Chef, John wrote, while visiting Denver, Colorado, a friend lent me his taxi yellow checker marathon. That's the yellow car that you see in the right foreground of the painting. To drive all over the state, no time limit. Unfortunately, I was unable to sample the chef's magic. Soon after the painting's completion, it returned from my New York gallery, O.K. Harris, to the Denver Museum of Art for their permanent collection. On the lower right, we see a snapshot of John Bader holding the completed painting in 1975. Next slide, please. As Americans, pursued their dreams in the post-World War II era. They adopted the diner as a home away from home. For John Bader, the diner became a symbol of what was best about the America he grew up in, a nation of small towns and urban neighborhoods. Individual identities and even eccentricities were valued there. John Bader succeeded in preserving diners in his works of art. He also created a record of America when small towns were thriving, when small businesses had not been overshadowed by big box stores. 
and before fast food chains largely put diners out of business. We can visit that very different America in John Bader's works of art. Next slide, please. On behalf of John Bader, thank you for your attention. Thank you for appreciating his works of art and thank you to the Ulrich Museum of Art. Sorry, Jay, I had a moment, momentary technical difficulty there. Thank <laughs> you, that was absolutely wonderful and really fascinating. Um, and I wanna say to anyone and everyone listening out there in the ether, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A. Um, and if it's okay, I'll start us off. I had some questions. So sure. one thing I was noticing when, as you were going through your slides is that you very helpfully noted the geographic location of some of the diners. I was also astounded by how much you were able to find that's very closely connected to Kansas and Wichita. So I guess two questions. Okay. One is, do you have a secret stash of, uh, <laughs> of roadside culture paraphernalia about <laughs> Kansas or do you have it for every state? Like, is there a resource library? How did that happen? And well, then, that, that's how we do research, right? <laughs> so will you tell me more about this? Is, did you, did you, have you been collecting postcards and other things from every state? Well, John's the real expert on diners. He and some other folks who uh, really have taken, uh, like Dick Gutman uh, and others who have researched diners really for years and years, for decades, in fact. Uh, there, if you check the internet, you'll see that there's a whole uh, segment of research. People who track diners, you know, and they're few enough and far enough between now that uh, people track where they are, which ones have been preserved, which ones have been restored, which ones are still operating. Uh, and John Bader was involved with road roadside culture as a whole. I mean, he his diner paintings are really just part of his body of work. It, it's the most famous part of his body of work, but he was also very much interested in uh, Las Vegas before it was the glitzy place it is now. And he painted Las Vegas early on. Mm -hmm. uh, he painted locations uh, along Route 66. He also was very much interested in um, food trucks and food wagons because they really are the predecessors of diners. Back before mm -hmm. there were diners, there were food wagons that were horse drawn very much like the food trucks we have today. I was going to say, we, we've, come full, <laughs> we've come full circle. <laughs> yeah, we've come full circle. But John was painting uh, mobile food trucks well before they became a fad. And uh, he was really interested in the relationship of food and people mm -hmm. and also small, small scale entrepreneurs and how they, their relationships with their clientele. Uh, mm -hmm. When I talked about the sacred small town, that's no joke. He, John really feels that small town culture was very special and, and in general deserves to be preserved. And he sees diners as just being a very important part of that. So did that come, you said, I think you said he was born in Atlanta. Was he, was it in a small, small? Well, he was born in South Bend, Indiana, but he grew up in Atlanta. Okay. And then he went to, he got into the ad business in, in Atlanta, uh, actually left art school to take a job as an art director there at a very early age, and then was so successful that he was promoted. I mean, it was really unusual because he was in his early to mid twenties. And here he is at one of New York's top ad agencies. He worked at Marshawk and then he worked at uh, McCann Erickson which is still, I mean, if you've seen like the, the Mad Men series, I mean, yeah. that, John has said it was like that, except even more so. <laughs> that was <laughs> actually said, one of my questions is whether he's commented to you on the accuracy of Mad Men. So. Uh, he says, if you think that's crazy, it was crazy. Okay. And um, he said that it was really a kind of a dog eat dog business. He, he loved it. He enjoyed it. And he employed a lot of creativity. I mean, that was a golden age for advertising because uh, they had all the print media, you know, so 
print advertising was such a big thing. And John, so John was able to do a lot, you know, with his visual sense and his sense of humor and his appreciation of typography. A lot of those ads are just classic uh, and people, people still appreciate them for their creativity. Uh, and there, the ad agency that he worked for, he had a lot of really major clients. Coca-Cola was one of them. Pillsbury was one of them. Uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, which is Esso, which was later Exxon, was one of them. So these are really big time clients. You know, you, you're not playing at that level because they're spending millions of dollars on advertising. So there's a lot of pressure. He, he called it really boot camp for the art world. Yeah. If you think the art world can be dog eat dog, it's nothing compared to, to the advertising industry. So is his work then ever self-referential in the sense that might you see in one of his paintings like a sign that he himself had designed for Coke or for a gas uh, I, I don't know if that would be the case, but you know, if he came across an old Coke sign, it sort of would have a special relationship to him. Now, John doesn't always paint everything literally uh, that he sees, just like the, the slide I showed of the Blue Moon Diner, mm -hmm. that, that was, uh, he, that wasn't the name that the diner was really there by the side of the road and it was in transit, it was in transit being taken from where it had been located to another location to be refurbished. But he called it the Blue Moon Diner just for the, he, it, he thought it set a mood. Now, sometimes the, the diner names are absolutely accurate. You know, they're absolutely the name that was on the diner. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, he'll put like a sign in a window that will be like a reference to it. Like sometimes it's it's Ivan Karp's, <laughs> his art dealer's number. <laughs> sometimes oh, it's the number of a friend. There's a great piece mm -hmm. that he did of uh, a barbecue restaurant in Georgia, uh, Colonel Poole's uh, barbecue that has all these little signs that Colonel Poole would let you, they're, they're a little cut out of a pig. <laughs> and you would pay your money and you could put your name on it and, and put it in front of the restaurant. Uh, <laughs> and uh, when John painted the painting, it was all accurate, except that the names on the signs were like of his, his wife or, <laughs> or his art dealer or one of his friends, you know, so there are all these little in jokes sometimes in his paintings. I think actually, isn't Richard Estes known for the same thing? He always paints his signature into the urban landscape. Right, that, that, yes, I think that's true. Um, so John, John, these paintings are very personal for him. And he often took time to meet the people, like when he was photographing a diner, just like I mentioned with the Royal Diner, he'd go inside and meet the owner and talk to them and sometimes take pictures of the interior. And, you know, so he really, it, it was a personal thing. It wasn't just, just any old photograph. Did he see himself as kind of an ambassador for small town America in New York? Well, I think John sees himself as a preservationist. And yeah, I guess an ambassador for preservation, but also an ambassador, you could say, for humanism and human relationships. Because mm -hmm. the, you, know, you can't look at any of those diners and not think about the personality of who would name a diner that or what's it like? and you know, if they're if they're little pots of flowers or some other kind of personal touch, maybe curtains in the windows. You know, for him, those are all little touches that personalize the diner, or whatever the structure is he's painting. Usually a diner, uh, or the signage, because he loves signs. He collect he he went around during the time he was an art director uh, in those advertising agencies, doing a lot of photographs of hand painted signs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today, because of, of computers, people will just crank out a sign on their computer. Well, you know, it used to be that, like, you'd go down the road and you'd see all these wonderful hand-painted signs, like, uh, once in a while, you still see one. Like, I saw one in Georgia not long ago that was, it said, P-E-A-C-H-S for sale. Not peaches, but peach <laughs> for sale. <laughs> and it was all painted like by a, like a one inch brush on an old board. You know? And those are the kind of signs that just have great personality. Like one of the, one of the, my favorites that uh, John collected is a hand painted sign that says, no loud cussing. <laughs> just if you cuss softly, it's okay. <laughs> that was great. 
be great. Yeah, it, it does. It does immediately paint such a vivid picture of that play. <laughs> But John is a collector, and some of his works of art relate to his collections. Like he's collected model cars. He has like a whole shelf in his house, shelves in his house with like about 200 model Cadillacs. Oh, wow. And, you know, he collects folk art, uh, Southern folk art, and it's just great. Visiting, I wish everybody could visit his home because it's like going into a museum. That, no, that does sound amazing. Um, so, and, and where does he live now? You said- He's in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, that's right, you said. So actually, so there's a question from an anonymous attendee, so I can't credit the person, but, um, and I had a related question. My question was, you know, you showed the, the locations of the diners and I was wondering if there is like regional specificity or regional characteristics. And this person mm -hmm. is asking, did John have a favorite region of the country to find his sources for his diner painting? Well, you know, kind of ground zero for diners tends to be in the Northeast. Not that they're exclusively there, but there are a lot of them in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Jersey, New York. So a lot of the paintings are situated there, but he also, after he moved to Tennessee, he painted a lot of barbecue restaurants and barbecue joints. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, there's a sort of a Southern aspect to some of his work as well. But when he would travel and he traveled very widely, you know, he painted diners all over the country. And I think he was appreciated the particular local characteristics that are often reflected in the food. Like you go into a particular, a, a diner that was in a particular place and they'd have some local kind of thing on the, on the menu that he would appreciate. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, there's another related question from Catherine Ring. Did Bader make any connections to truck stops or saloons? I guess how wide, like how broadly does his interest in American roadside culture go? Well, when he, he certainly painted, um, early on when he was painting from black and white, those black, black and white postcard images, mm -hmm. um, some of those were more varied than just diners. I mean, there were probably gas stations, there were gas stations, tourist camps, motels, uh, not truck stops particularly, although he certainly, if you look at his book, his book, Gas, Food and Lodging, mm -hmm. there's certainly uh, places along the road that you might consider truck stops, like a, a, a gas station that has a, a full scale airplane mounted mm -hmm. above the gas station, you know, crazy things like that that you used to see along the road. So actually speaking of gas stations, we have a, a, a related question to that. Lee Starkle is asking, did John have any interactions with Ed Ruscha? And she's commenting, I think rightly, the same, that John Bader is the same caliber of American artist as Ruscha. And I think you know there is such a connection sort of, mm -hmm. in of interest in mundane or quotidian American. Yeah, you. yeah, you're certainly aware of Ed Ruscha's work. I, I don't know whether they were whether they met in New York, I wouldn't be surprised if they did. I'll have mm -hmm. to ask on that, but I, I'm sure he was aware of Ed Ruscha's work. Yeah, that, that seems like a really interesting connection. Um, let's see. Um, Catherine Ring also commented, I love, and I was, I was fascinated by this too, I love the analogy of diners to the archetypal mother, beautiful and there when you need her. Was that a connection that a lot of viewers made of his work or sort of? Well, I can only speak for, for John that uh, he really felt like the, the diners were a symbol of nurturing because it's like where people from the community came to be fed or travelers could count on to be fed. And that, as I said in that one slide, that, that act of communal food or communal eating, you know, goes back to way beyond patriarchal culture. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's very, you know, it's all tied in with the earth being the provider and who feeds you, the, the way you're fed. And if you're not fed at home, and we all come from agrarian roots, if you go back far enough, you know, so somewhere back in our DNA, I think we, we react to being fed on a very 
gut level or very heart level maybe and i think for john it was on the level of the heart and he felt that was part of the archetypal feminine does he come from a family of good cooks well that's a good question um i'm sure his mother probably did cook quite a bit <laughs> i thought of that because uh one of my colleagues at the orange you know she she's mentioned that she became a good cook because her mom wasn't i feel like we have this this vision of the archetypal mother as a good cook but what happens to people what the people <laughs> mothers are not good cooks? well there you go that's what the diner's for <laughs> right right that's true <laughs> Um, our, so we have another question from Pat Purvis. Are diners unique to the United States? Are they are they peculiar to the United States? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Um, lunch wagons and and other you know local eateries probably are not necessarily pe peculiar to the United States, but um, as something that was manufactured. And especially the diners that were manufactured uh, in the 20s and 30s, into especially the 30s and into the 40s, mm -hmm. they really picked up on that kind of modernist aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, the machine age, you know, and mm -hmm. all of that was kind of in the air in those days. You know, it's like Charlie Chaplin's yeah. modern times. You know, everybody had this idea that they were living in a different era and life should be kind of modern, whatever that meant. And okay. so that shiny metal and I mean, that that kind of promoted a sense of cleanliness, too, which people liked in a restaurant. And the fact that you could see the chef usually in a, in a diner. Uh, and it was kind of nice on a lot of levels, you know, because you, uh, you got to oftentimes chat or trade remarks with the cook or the waiter or the waitress. And, mm -hmm. you know, your server became kind of like a friend. You, they knew, hey, the usual, you know. Mm -hmm. Having your same egg salad sandwich with Swiss cheese on it, yeah. You know? <laughs> so how how in the places where they were common, would there be one per like every few city blocks? Were there so many that the regulars would? Oh, there were there were a lot. Yeah, I mean, and especially in places like Massachusetts, New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, Rhode Island, New York, there were lots of diners. I mean, when you th think about how many fast food joints you see in the average town today, I mean, how many Burger Kings and McDonald's are there today? Now, it's true, we're traveling even more. But if you think uh, there weren't any Burger Kings, there weren't any McDonald's in the heyday of the diner. Um, so there were lots of them because, you know, people began to travel after World War II. They were hitting the road and there was a demand. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you've really convinced me that it's there's something really special in them in the sense that they're this they're this vernacular modernist architectural form, right? That made, you know, an architectural vocabulary that was still kind of forbidding, accessible to a really mm -hmm. broad audience. And there's also this interesting kind of balance there between on the one hand, they're kind of uh, they're mass produced so they're familiar as a distinct architectural form but mm -hmm. then each, each one can be customized to a degree that we don't expect you know like every chipotle is, looks identical right yeah, every right. panel looks identical so there's this nice kind of balance there yeah um, i mean on the one hand every diner was you know all of diners of a particular model looked kind of alike but mm -hmm. then on the other hand the first thing the owner would do is personalize it mm -hmm. you know their sign, their name, the things they put in the window, the the curtains, all that stuff became made it an individual place. For what it's worth, there is still memory in Wichita about Valentine diners, and there was recently actually an article in our local newspaper about a Valentine diner being preserved and continuing to be a diner, partly because it was featured on TV as a as a not notable diner. So we're part of that story of preservation there you go <laughs> um, so let's see we have a couple more questions these have to do with um john bader's artistic practice so mm -hmm. one question from marcia stopa is how true was his palette to local color did he take a lot of liberties um i would say from the paintings i've seen john paints the diner itself usually pretty accurately in terms of color 
but where he takes liberties would be in like in his skies. And I've looked at a lot of John's diner paintings and his skies make me think of the skies that I see in Dutch paintings of the golden age. Mm -hmm. There, he, he has a real way with, with skies and he uses the sky, the color in the sky to kind of harmonize with the colors in, in, the, in the painting otherwise. He also really takes a lot of care in photographing his subject matter at a particular time of day. Like he, he made a lot of his, his photography was usually, I think, with Kodachrome slides. And Kodachrome is really saturated, but very true color. And those slides, you know, I've got some of my dad's Kodachrome slides from the 50s and they haven't faded a bit. Um, and unlike Ektachrome and some other color, you know, other color is, is much more fugitive, but mm -hmm. Kodachrome usually is pretty. And so working from those Kodachrome slides, he got sort of saturated color, but he also worked at a particular time of day when the sun was at a particular place. Mm -hmm. he, would, he would go to a diner maybe on a Sunday morning or on an afternoon, depending on what kind of light. Uh, sometimes he'll take, like if there's a parking lot with a puddle, he might take a little bit of liberties with like the reflection in the puddle, like he'll, because it reflects the sky usually. So the, the sky color and the, and the puddle reflection might then coordinate with other color in like, if it's an evening shot where the, or after dark, where at dusk, where the neon is coming on or the lights are coming on, all of this might be reflected. And so he, you know, he thinks deeply about these color relationships that are, they're, uh, he honors what's there, but he also is very much aware of what those color relationships are. Mm -hmm. Well, I was fascinated by what you said about what drew him to the linen finish postcards, right? The fact that these were already very heavily edited images. And I think what you're saying about the saturation of the Kodachrome color kind of confirms my feeling that part of what makes hyperrealism and photorealism, sort of whichever term you want to use in each specific case. So interesting is that as much as anything, they are about preserving the history of how we make images, right? Because mm -hmm. they're this like second degree image. They're not painted from life. And so they preserve right. both the reality and the media of how most people preserve reality in this case. The, the right, color. right. I mean, John does paint from images, but he doesn't, you know, some people think, oh, he just takes a slide projector and projects onto the canvas and traces. No, no way. Uh, I mean, I've been in his studio when he was, when paintings were in progress. And he'll have like uh, a pretty good size print of, from the slide kind of pinned up next mm -hmm. to the easel. And he's just painting. I mean, he doesn't, I mean, he just, he has an absolutely amazing eye. Yeah. And his watercolors, I have never seen anybody paint watercolor with more precision than he does. I mean, um, some of his watercolors are. I mean, you know how difficult a medium watercolor yeah, is to control. Yeah, yeah. And John had fabulous control over watercolor. You can't do watercolors anymore because of uh, health problems. But if you see his watercolors, they're in, in a way even more impressive than his oil paintings. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you including the, the watercolor of the rose on the, on the yeah. uh, what's it called, uh, on the windowsill. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, sometimes as an art historian, sometimes things just happened to, in a fortuitous way. I'd seen a black and white image of that mm. that's in one of the diner books, but that painting just came up for auction recently. Oh, and I saw it, I thought, oh, great, you know, and so I could grab an image of that and, and use it in the presentation. Yeah, and it was perfect with one of our prints that, because it's the inside of that very diner. Um, so related to that, Jim Farley is asking, and actually related to what you said about the painting coming up for auction, um, are prints of his paintings available outside books, which I think they are, right? Like they're, uh, we have them in our collection. Were they, lim I'm, I'm also guessing they were limited edition prints and they are now? Well, John has done, John has rarely done, I, I don't, I think the only 
The only color reproductions that he's done are in some museum posters. Okay. Um, the the serographs, the 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 screen prints, the silk screens that uh, that the Ulrich's prints are part of that series. Mm -hmm. That was that's the only time that oh. he allowed any of his images to be screen printed. Okay. And um, I mean, he's such a stickler about color that okay. I I think you know the. They approached the color in the paintings, but I think for him, the paintings were more satisfying. And I think he um, he did black and white prints. I think because uh, in etching, like in soft ground etchings, uh, and um, in the black and white images, images, I think they were probably more more satisfying to him because you didn't have to deal with the issue of color. Mm -hmm. Because once you start dealing with color, for him, it's like, how do you compare any print process with uh, with painting? Unless you're like doing a, an actual kind of lithographic reproduction, but mm -hmm. uh, you know that's that's just not the direction he wanted to go in. I see. So, so it sounds like what we have is actually quite rare and was rare in his body of work. Well, he and a number of artists were involved in in a in that series in a series that was done by london arts okay and that and and that uh once that was kind of like the one and only mm -hmm. thing like that that he ever got involved with that i'm aware of okay okay um let's see uh, i am looking um oh another question from lee starkle uh what led you to study john vader well, I was working as curator at the Morris Museum of Art in Augusta, Georgia. And um, the director of the museum, Kevin Grogan, who is a very good friend of mine, uh, had known John Bader in Nashville. And I was aware of John's work, but because Kevin had had this personal friendship with John when uh, Kevin had been director of Cheekwood, a museum mm -hmm. in Nashville, and he and John had gotten to know each other and they hung out with some of the same people and singer songwriters and other kinds of creative types. And so he, he had always wanted to do a major exhibition of John Bader's work. And so he said, hey, Jay, I think we should do a retrospective, uh, a John Bader retrospective. And I said, great, I love his work. So he said, well, give John a call. I'm sure he'll be up for it. But I think you two are going to hit it off. So we did the show. I interviewed John and we got to be friends. And that was, oh gosh, let's see, about 20 years ago almost. <laughs> and uh, and then I changed jobs. I was at the Vero Beach Museum of Art and, uh, and uh, John said, Kevin called me again. He said, John's looking for somebody uh, he's not going to let anybody write about him except you. He wants you to be <laughs> his biographer. And I said, great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did a I did a proposal to a publisher. The publisher agreed, and we were on our way. It took me about two and a half, three years to write the book. Okay. That's quite something. So it was a did you guys talk over the course of the of the long time in between between the first exhibition and the book? Oh yeah, and I and I I I went up to Nashville and spent a lot of time with John. I I probably recorded like something like thirty hours of interviews with him. On, I mean, riding a lot. You know, the old nineteen forty one Cadillac Fleetwood. <laughs> we were we went to an Indian restaurant in that. and I'm interviewing him on the way. You know, so that's so cool. Um, it was a great time, but I you know so I had those. Uh, those recordings, which then, you know, when you've got that many hours of, of interviews, it's a, it's quite a job to go through and sort it all out. But uh, that was, that was important information. And then I spent time at archives and doing other research. And mm -hmm. so talking to people who knew John gave me a list of people he'd worked with in the advertising business. And mm -hmm. I interviewed a lot of them. So it was yeah, a lot of work, but a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it sounds fascinating. I absolutely love the many connections you make to kind of embed his work in a larger cultural history. We have a question from Lori in Fair Oaks, California, perhaps someone you know, who says Jay did a wonderful job capturing Bader's work. And she's also asking whether John still paints today. John unfortunately has macular degeneration. He also has had some other health problems and he painted up until relatively recently. And um, his last series of paintings was of diner matchbook covers, oh. matchbook covers the, from diners that he had collected. Before that, he, he did a whole series of aircraft paintings of classic aircraft based on photographs that he had collected as a kid back in the 1940s. And they're wonderful, I mean, historic aircraft. Uh, and then I think before that, he painted that last series of diners that I mentioned uh, that was around, I don't know, 2010, 11, mm -hmm. which were, he went, he was doing what he called archeology span in his slide collection. And he picked out a series of, of slides that had never ended up as paintings, but ones that he thought were special. So he did. So, you know, he he painted as long as he possibly could, but then health problems just intervened and he unfortunately had to quit painting. Wow. But he's still uh, on Instagram. Anybody who wants to follow John on Instagram oh, certainly wow. can. And he he often will post a wonderful photograph from his historic collection of historic photographs. They're all terrific. Well, kudos to him for conquering social media. I don't have an Instagram account. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that he does makes me feel. <laughs> yeah, he does. Sometimes he posts on Facebook, but more often on Instagram. Yeah, my sense is that that's the preferred social media for visual people and artists, that it yeah, captures, so captures our- follow, follow John Bader on Instagram and you'll, 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 you're in for some visual treats. That's really cool. So, well, I want to be respectful of your time and our audience's time. So I just want to pass on a couple of compliments. David Forshgott says, bravo, Jay. Thanks for reintroducing me to Bader. Catherine Ring says, this was wonderfully interesting. Thank you. And I want to join them in saying thank you so much for a really informative and sort of really delightful talk. Um, it was wonderful to have you with us. And wonderful. Well, that's an honor. And I, I really appreciate all those folks <laughs> sitting through this and and giving me their time thank you yeah and now and we're thank all... you to the all rich one more time oh no it was it, it's really our pleasure and yeah I, as, as the curator of the exhibition i feel just that much more pleased that we were able to showcase his work so my pleasure thank you, Jay. <laughs> okay. and thanks again jana and ksenia and thanks to all of you. I see many of you have been following us um, for most of these presentations and you've had wonderful questions and we thank you for that. And we hope that you'll join us all back at the museum beginning in August. In person. Yeah. In person, yes indeed. <laughs> thank you, Jay. It was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Good night. Have a great evening. Good night.